The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Before we begin, I want to uh, remind everybody about uh, those that are really, really pressing in uh, to a deeper relationship with the Lord to check on these two CDs or DVDs. Uh, the Song of Solomon that we've done as a series and uh, Jennifer's version of the Divine Humanity, and they, they, they go together wonderfully. Uh, so they're online. You can get them on the online store. Uh, Get them in the bookstore if you're present. But for those watching, uh, especially especially our serious students from Missouri, Chicago, Oklahoma, Virginia, the Hawaii, Hawaii uh, we've got regulars that uh, probably are connected uh, in, uh, very deeply to our material, and they're reproducing according to kind. Alabama. Uh, we see Alita in Alabama. So anyway, all right. But today's message, now you've heard, I don't know if you pay any attention to fast food and, and candy in the candy store, but uh, there's bite size, regular size, fun size, super size, right? Well, today's message is God-sized, all right? So I wanted you to be ready. We're getting a little diagram of... Uh, of what God gave me literally uh, in the only trance that I've had in 40 some years as a Christian, there was one time where I was in a biblical trance. I was in a individual's home and I wasn't expecting anything and uh, we were just visiting and I looked up and they had a um, stained glass window. And you know, stained glass windows has the little partitions in it. It had a little dome at the top and the bottom, you know, of course you've had layers on your sill. But all I know is that I went into a trance and God basically downloaded to me an answer to the question that I had. I knew that as a, as a, as a baby Christian that I was called to preach, but I also knew that I was not going to be hired like by a church. I was going to uh, found a work, a new work from scratch or to plant a church from scratch. But I didn't have any training, didn't know how to do it, so I just asked God, how do I do that? All right? And all of this stems from two uh, really super clear uh, visions. The one vision, or the first vision, was I was a new believer filled with the Holy Spirit and grieved uh, in my spirit, when I saw an article in, uh, I think it was Psychology Today, it was some, some magazine that was in uh, at my parents' house, and it was in a uh, magazine rack. And I just looked down, and I saw that there were educated people going to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship to go to the Father's kingdom. And on the inside, it was like sickening, like I wanted to, to throw up. It was nauseating. And I went, God... How could intelligent people fall for that? You know, and at the same time, I opened up a Bible. It was a living Bible, and I opened up that was laying there, and the Scripture, I know people use this as an expression, but the Scripture came off the page into the air, and I was reading it as letters of living light. And the Scripture was in the living translation, Hosea 3 5 and it was answering my question of why I was so grieved over these people going astray and how could they you know how could they believe such nonsense and the scripture came off and it said afterwards they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord and his goodness or his blessings in the days ahead, in the latter days, in the end times. 
and it answered something for me. It's like, you know what? Uh, I, I, actually, I got saved the same way. I had to exhaust all my efforts at what would make Dennis happy. <laughs> you know, I tried this, I tried that, I tried this, I tried that. Uh, I even subscribed to multiple magazines subscriptions, thinking that I'm going to get a magazine and there's going to be an article in there and it's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, Like I'm going to find whatever that is, that search. Uh, I didn't want religion because when I was a kid, I went to Catholic school for first grade and second grade. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want that. I wonder how many preachers said, but one thing I didn't want was religion. Okay. But... Uh, that scripture came off and it answered the question that afterwards they will return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King and they will come trembling and submissive to the Lord and to his goodness in the end times. And of course we know that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And after that, the incident in the house with the stained glass window happened next. Because I said, God, I know I'm to plant a church. I know I'm to preach. I know that's what I was called uh, to do. But uh, how do you do that? that matter of fact, and to this day, that's kind of like our, our little uh, motto. Uh, when we travel church to church up in New England, people would say, these are the how-to people. Because the Bible is strong on the what to do, but how to do it. All right. I've seen many frustrated people we ministered to and brought them into the realm of the spirit in an experiential way who were told, just do it by their leaders. <laughs> and sometimes you frustrate a person more by just saying, just do it. Uh, the how to's are an absolute necessity or the wisdom of application is an absolute necessity in the body. So I'm looking at this stained glass window and from that day forward, I laid out this little thing. Some of you have it on your tables. Uh, uh, I suppose those are watching by uh, video. Can uh, Jason will put it up on the, on the YouTube, the little diagram. But here's what the Lord said. Now, this is generic. What's beautiful about this is eventually I built a dome church. Not that that was the goal. The goal was what it was pointing to, the concepts that it was pointing to. And... What, what uh, the Lord showed me was you start on the bottom and that the first and foremost thing is you start with intimacy with God. You cannot build. Everything in the Bible is the life of God, the Zoe life of God and building, life and building. And he doesn't build with anything other than life. Um, so there's no other foundation but Jesus. And the first step that the Lord showed was that if you're going to build a congregation, it's the same way as you build your own life. Uh, you start with, there's no other foundation other than Jesus in your life. Intimacy with God. There's therefore no, no condemnation. Then he said, after this, it was, so I'm, he's teaching me to pray. He's teaching me to, to walk the walk, so to speak. And the second thing was patterns and principles, that when God builds, he builds everything according to a pattern based on a principle. He's a wise master builder. And he had me in that section understand that the Beatitudes and Proverbs was application. There's a lot of wisdom in the Beatitudes. And by the way, Beatitudes has nothing to do so much with doing as it does with becoming. Be attitudes and the be happy attitudes. And probably one of my most favorite words uh, in the Greek is makarios. And you can see it in the Amplified Version. It's the be happy, full of life, joy, and satisfaction. Makarios was when uh, Christians were being fed to the lions. Heathen said that these people have a makarios a life joy that is enviable. So the second pattern was patterns and principles and learn to stay in the Beatitudes and develop that as a B attitude. And actually, if you look at the Beatitudes from one through eight, it's a progressive growth process. Study it. You start out 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. You've got to start out humble. But in reality, it goes down and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, the third element was the foundational doctrines. How many know Hebrews 6? Many, many churches use this as a, uh, as a basics course for people. They teach them. Uh, Hebrews 6, uh, in the first few verses, is called the elementary or foundational teachings of Jesus. You know where that's at in Hebrews 6. And, but what does it say after that? It's foundational teachings, but at the end of Hebrews 1 through 6, or, or Hebrews 6, in those elementary teachings, he said, let's move on to maturity. So it's clearly foundational. The fourth element was leadership and assembly. And what this evidenced was that the, there, there's a proper attitude in the building process for believers. Uh, in the Didache, which was the training manual before the apostles had the New Testament down in print, the Didache showed that uh, people had to be taught. They were born again, most of them Gentiles, which means they had no Jewish background. They didn't have any Ten Commandments. They had to be taught how to live in corporate life. It was one thing to be born again. It was another thing to be ready for corporate life. And that was the fourth level. Now, you see the pillars, one, two, and three, uh, various uh, uh, priorities. God showed me in the Old Testament and Old Testament times, when they built a structure, the walls didn't hold up the ceiling. The pillars held up the ceiling or the roof. And what God was showing me was priority one. And now this is generic. This should be for any church. This should be for any pastor starting out and using this as a guideline to see, double check themselves to see if, the, if they're covering all their bases in their teaching. But priority one is worship in the word. Everybody knows that's standard. But worship in the word needs to be done in spirit and in truth, or truth is reality. It needs to be real. It's not about singing songs. Unsaved people can sing songs. It's about flowing from the heart of a spirit of worship. Priority number two, and we were always a stickler for this, it's one thing to know worship in the word. You can attend church. It can, for some people, it can be like a club, just something you do. Uh, but for others, it's transformation. If the reality of worship in the Word isn't changing your life, there's something missing. Because it's not just something you add to your life. It's something that is supposed to change and radically transform you. The third pillar, some would call it evangelism, but what we saw it as if there was truly an internal transformation, what you would see is demonstration. You know, the gospel of the kingdom needed to be demonstrated, not just lip service. That's when the world's going to believe. That they're going to believe because they see your love one toward another. It's going to have to be something that is tangibly visible, not just convincing them theologically. And so uh, God said from the, from the base of intimacy with God, there's no other foundation. I want you to learn wisdom and you learn that from the Beatitudes. You learn it from, uh, uh, obviously, from Proverbs. Proverbs is if man does this, then this happens. Application, according to patterns, based on principles. Then teach them the foundational doctrines. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God. That's Hebrews 6. What the Bible calls elementary or foundational teachings of Jesus. I think before you move on to maturity... You better have really looked closely at the foundational truths to see to what degree am I walking and living in that. Pillar number one, one of the priorities is worship in the word. Priority two is transformation. Priority three is demonstration. You know, we were called to be living epistles. The Holy Spirit was to be written on us so that it depicted life. It was lived. It was visible. It was people, uh, we've had many people uh, 
come for ministry because they saw someone who they were this way and then they got ministry and they're that way. Uh, <clears throat> the atmosphere, and I found this fascinating. God says the key with the corporateness is to create or the dome, what it represented, was to create an atmosphere that's conducive to growth. You know, you need the proper, if you had a garden, you need the proper climate. You need the proper atmosphere for things to grow. You need more than just the, the water and the, and the sun. You need the atmosphere to be conducive. And God says, the atmosphere is love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and grace. You know, in Zechariah where it says, and they brought the capstone with shouts of grace to it. And what's really interesting is uh, years later, later uh, I saw that uh, love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and grace, that it actually was the solution through a work of the cross. It was the solution to fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of punishment, fear of incompetence. And the four words, and these are not words that everybody uses all the time, but uh, love was depicted because through a work of the cross you had justification. As a matter of fact, if you're, you want to do a good study on that, on seeing how the atmosphere is a genuine work of the cross and all four of these elements, look up justification. Justification will reveal the love of God on the other side. God loved us, justified us, just as if we hadn't sinned. Reconciliation. You are reconciled to God, and through the work of the cross of reconciliation, rejection has been washed away. Through propitiation, your sins were forgiven, and it produced the forgiveness. Now, in this church, we've taught that in in that atmosphere, forgiveness is not just a one-time deal. Forgiveness should become a lifestyle. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. Um, and lastly, uh, incompetence. Regeneration. What regeneration does is it gets us back in the image, back into the original state of the new creation, and the way we're going to look. So those are four big words, but it showed me that the kingdom of darkness is all based on fear, whether it's fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of punishment, fear of uh, incompetence. All of those are the carnality and the kingdom of fear. And love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace covered all of those. And so God was saying, this is the atmosphere that's conducive. Uh, for for living, uh, and when that takes place, he showed me, and this is all all in a trance, getting just these basic principles down. They all got developed later. I'm giving you a lot of stuff that came later, but initially it was this, and it says this is the vision. Now. From the base of the temple, how many have heard that scripture in Ezekiel 47? that the rivers of living water flowed from the base of the temple, just like out of my belly flows rivers of living water. But here's the three, three things uh, that to me are important, that this was a God-sized vision for building. First of all, write these three things down. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision... The people perish. Where there is no redemptive revelation. You see, right there, many people have, and I've even heard it even, even in Christian circles, well, I have this dream or I have this, you know, some of those are man-made. They're not all God. Is it redemptive? You can have a vision to live on the beach, but it might not be God. It might just be your good idea, all right, something you want. And you say, I have a vision, I have a dream. Carnality can have all kinds of visions and dreams. What you want to know is, God, I want your plan for my life. I want a redemptive revelation. And here's the thing. When this dome, pillars, and, and uh, 
these uh, foundational layers, here's something that's really important. I did not pick this. I did not pick this and say, oh, this looks like fun. I'm going to implement this. This came in a trance, and as God said, this is the outline. You pursue me, and it will unfold. I did not pick this, but I obeyed this. And, you know, years later, I built a dome church, a geodesic dome. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But, it, but the goal was not to build a dome church. The goal was what it portrayed far superior. And I believe it's even taking place now. I believe the glory is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, and that's going to be the dome. All right? And the second thing is, and this applies to you, not just me, but first of all, I had the redemptive revelation. It was a, it was a um, God plan. <laughs> it was his design. It wasn't my idea. It required my obedience. But the second thing was, is that the proper order to see this come to pass was Galatians 1, 15 and 16, where God literally spoke to me and said, God separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. The next time you feel like you have a vision from God, make sure that the primary vision is to form his life in you. It's not what you do, it's what you are. Your doing should flow out of what you are. So, first of all, like I said, without a redemptive revelation, people perish. And one of the ways God showed it to me, and this really dates me, because this goes back to like, I don't know, I don't think they've had these since the 1950s or 60s. But they used to have a football game that was a metal sheet you got to be really old to know this one. And you plugged it in, and you put these little uh, little plastic football players on the teams. And when you turn the power on, the board vibrated. Now, usually I had trouble getting the quarterback to actually go anywhere but in a circle. Uh, but God said, that without a redemptive revelation is where my church is at. Oh, they're busy. And they're going here and they're going there, but they're not accomplishing my purposes. But afterwards, remember the scripture that came off the page? Afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God. After what? After they've exhausted all their foolishness, after they've got tired. And in some cases, they've got to crash and burn a few times, more than once. <laughs> but God said, I'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. My recommendation to young people at this point in time is, Take the easier route. Find out what God wants for you and do it instead of your good ideas, your dreams, your visions, your wants, your desires. Because all of that stuff, it, God says, afterwards, after they're exhausted, they will return to the Lord their God. And I don't care how crazy they got. They will return to the Lord their God. And the glory's coming to the church. And they're going to return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King. And they're going to come trembling and submissive to the Lord and to his goodness. Goodness leads you to repentance, though. It's going to be his holiness, yes, but his goodness is going to be the, the thing that satisfies on the inside to such a degree that you can't wait to reciprocate. That's when you know God's done a work in you, when you can't wait to serve him, not out of willpower, but because the satisfaction was so rich in you, it's overflowing to a want to. Come on, you've had somebody really love you, you want to love them back, all right? And many people say, I love Jesus, but are you in love with Jesus? Because it's not until you are in love with him that it overflows with satisfaction to where you just can't help but reciprocate. Uh, those of you that uh, remember in the Song of Solomon, my favorite thing, and I do this now, it's fun. You can do this in the car, you can do this at home, you can do this in school, at work, whatever. Do it in the grocery store, whatever. The palaquin. Do you know that we are the palaquin? Do you know what the palaquin was? It was the place, it was a uh, carriage type thing, although I think they carried him, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, that'd be a rough ride, I think. But the palaquin was a place where you could rest and sleep 
but it also had motion or moved. And in the journey of the bride in the Song of Solomon, uh, it was to, for her to become the palaquin. A palaquin is that carriage. So what God's looking for is when we can offer him the place of resting in us and abiding in us, but in him we live and move and have our being. God's looking for both. He wants you to be his resting place and his dwelling place, but he also wants you to accomplish the purposes of which he, he called you to do. So it needs to be a place of rest where God can place his head upon, just like he did on John, on John's breast. So let him lay his head upon us in the spirit, but also let us be about his business. So anyway, uh, this, uh, this vision that... Jesus was to reveal his son in me was the internal vision. And in Acts 26, 19, Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This was a heavenly vision. I didn't make this up. This was something that God did. I bet you he did to the workers in the wilderness, didn't he? Make the tabernacle according to my instruction. He didn't ask them their opinion. Right? He didn't say, well, I don't know. I'd kind of like to move it over this way a little bit, or I'd rather use a different, just do it according to the plan. And I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, and I kept the vision before the people. And it was continually to reiterate what was going on on the inside of us. First of all, through intimacy with God, was Jesus being formed in me. Full stature means maturity. That was our goal. Our goal was, I don't want, we don't, Baby Christians don't do well here because we're a discipleship effort and we teach you to go to the Jesus in you. Most church expects someone to do their thing to me. That's lazy. You're a believer. You've got all of the God tools on the inside of you. They're ready and they're at hand, right? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You're all familiar with that scripture, casting down imaginations and high things. Well, you read that in the message translation, which is paraphrased, and it said we have these God tools for bringing a life, mind, will, and emotions into subjection unto the Lordship of Jesus for the purpose of maturity. And these tools are ready and at hand. Well, if they're ready and at hand, why do we run around looking for somebody to do something to us? If they're ready at hand, it means the tools are within Christ within. You have everything necessary in him. Now, well, we confess our faults one to another that we might be healed. There's, there's beneficial uh, iron sharpening iron, and there's a, obviously a place for it. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. But primarily, you don't have someone to minister to you on the job, in school, at the grocery store. You're going to have to have your own personal walk with God and your own uh, set of knowing how to deal God's watching how you respond. Like Jennifer said, I'm talking about a God-sized vision for building. And one time she called me. She didn't like my attitude when I drove. And, she, you know, you can walk in the Spirit. doesn't mean you're driving in the Spirit. Right? <laughs> and I knew I was in trouble because she had me in the kitchen with her. I was thinking. I don't know about you, but when my wife says, I was thinking, um, I'm getting ready. She, she says, you know, the road is like a microcosm of the kingdom. I go, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> and on the road, those are God's people. And I'm thinking, you know, that one that goes 20 miles an hour in a 55, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those are God's people. Mm -hmm. And he placed them exactly where he wanted to. So that you can see what's in your heart. Because the kingdom of God is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. So you, you can't just do this in church. You got to do this on the road. Even when you're hidden behind a vehicle to where you think <laughs> those are not people. Those are hazards that are in my way. Obstacles. Yes, they are. You know, all right. But God was showing us that to be not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Um, the church, the first time it's mentioned, as a matter of fact, 
is in uh, Matthew 16, uh, based on the law of first mention. The first time the word church is used, which, by the way, it's better to look at it as congregation. Otherwise, you start picturing buildings. But church is, is the called out ones, the ecclesia. They have been called out to assemble. So God's talking about his assembly. So that means at some point on that dome, I saw that church was corporate and that the corporate mindset is not commonplace. The individual is what is, seems to be the priority. And when we mature, we do have to mature individually, but we also get to the point where we're ready for corporate life. Hmm? Now, I looked at Matthew 16 and it said, Jesus came to the region and says, who do you say I am? And basically, that was one of the best ways to start in preparing a church. Who do you say he is? Who's Jesus to you? Are you in love with him or do you just say, I love Jesus? A backslider can say, I love Jesus and be sincere. There is a passionate pursuit, however, that God is calling us to. Well, people say this, people say that. But he, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? So the requirement for building a God-sized vision is intimate knowledge of Jesus as the Messiah. Intimate knowledge. Where is that? Gee, that was right on the bottom. And by the way, I like the way God showed me I started at the bottom. You know, more of us started at the bottom. We'd be a lot better off. Know what all start at the top. <laughs> yep, I already knew that. I already knew that. People that are fast to say I already knew that scare me. <laughs> they usually need the most ministry. Uh, <clears throat> the second part was, who do you say to am? Well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. So what we see is, but my Father in heaven, the second characteristic of a congregation, of an individual becoming ready for corporate life, would be not only intimate knowledge, but would also have to have a revelation of the Father, or revelation, or reality. Did you notice that center pillar? You can call that center pillar number one, priority one, worship in the Word. Well, every church will agree with worship in the Word, but how much reality is it? Are you ministering in reality and spirit and reality, which truth and reality are interchangeable in the Bible? Are you ministering with reality? Are you ministering with not just the Word, but is that word the living word? Because all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So you can look at the word of God as quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, but it's not an it. That word is a person, and it's living, and all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. That relationship is mandatory if you're ever going to build, move up, up, so to speak. The, the next thing was, he said, uh, Blessed are you, uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father. So you've got revelation of the Father. You're getting revelation. You're in communion and union. The third thing is, he says, he changed his name from uh, Simon, which is like a reed tossed in the wind, to a stone. And upon that revelation of Jesus as the Messiah, I will build my church. So what's the third thing? A change in nature. Pillar number two was transformation. If you're truly in pillar number one, the reality of worship in the word, this is good for any young pastor to double check his own congregation to see, because this thing is a biblical outline of the way we're supposed to live according to the word of God. Transformation. Was there a nature change? Hmm? You know, one of the things the Lord showed me about nature changes, uh, especially in the prophetic camp, we have so many people with revelation. But God always says, take that revelation. If it's a truth or reality, if it's a truth to you, then that truth should be cultivated in your life and you should be willing to look for the fruit. Truth should be cultivated and it should bear fruit. So why not be honest with yourself? The next time you get a revelation, has it changed your life? 
Do you own it? Is it written on the tablet of your heart? Can you demonstrate that? Is it easier to believe than not to believe? That's a good sign there, right there. If something's easier to believe than not to believe, you're not struggling with it, you own it. It's a reality. It's there. So the third element for church, ecclesia, is a nature change. And keep in mind, the names in the Bible and the nature match. Do you know even demons are that way? Their name matches their function. And what God had me do and took through this this new little fledgling church of mine, we took the names of God and said, we're not going to just sit here and memorize the names of God. You're going to walk in those relationships with those names until there's a measure of reality. For me, it was, I can remember El Shaddai. Uh, God kind of played a neat little game with me because I was looking at El Shaddai and I wanted to walk in the reality of it. But prior to that, I was a little concerned that in the Bible it said they multiplied the loaves and the fishes and there was leftover. And I don't know if I'm a little OCD or what, but I was kind of concerned that there was leftovers. Like if this miracle take place, it should have been exact. <laughs> and that's when God said, ha ha, Dennis. You know, very strange thinking. <laughs> I'm El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. The God who overflows your cup runneth over. <gasps> it dawned on me that's not wasteful. It's rather, it's an extravagant lover pouring forth on me. Oh, it's not wasteful. Here I was judging Jesus' miracle because he didn't count properly. If there was 5,000 loaves and fishes, there shouldn't have been leftovers. It should have been the exact right amount. Now, I know I'm the only one that has crazy thinking like that, but there's got to be things in the Bible that you read that you kind of want. Oh, that's kind of strange. If something hits you as kind of strange, that's probably an area you need to pursue God and have him reveal the reality of it. And what's he trying to say through it? Okay. So the next thing is, is that he said, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. I will build my congregation. So unless the Lord builds, and if you go from Genesis to Revelation, Everything in the Bible has to, it starts with a garden, it ends with a city. But everything in between is, just like the journey of the bride and the Song of Solomon, it's from, it's from that awakening to the relationship to the maturity of corporateness. And God is saying from the beginning in the garden to the end in revelations of a city, it's going to be cultivating one to be corporate. Now, after you have intimate knowledge, after you realize you're getting revelation from the Father, after you know that that requires a nature change, then God says, I will build. Okay, if God's building, what's my job? Hmm? If God's doing the building, how do I do this? And that's where you learn yielding, the grace of yielding and cooperating. Because one of the most difficult scriptures to get through uh, when we travel church to church in ministering to some people was, it is God who is at work in you. And then you got to hit them with both. Both to will and to do. You know, we had to teach people, and we were in well-taught churches, but we still had to teach them how to forgive. Simple thing like forgiveness. What does Matthew 18 says? Unless you forgive from the heart. But you know what? If they think their heart's the blood pumper, they're going to be a little bit off. If they think, as long as I'm sincere and I forgive from my head, as a matter of fact, most Christians do forgive sincerely from their head, but you can be sincerely wrong. Because only God can forgive sin, but yet God says in his word, you must forgive. What does that tell you? It's going to have to be both, not either or. So if it's God who is at work in you, what you are we talking about? The new creation you, the you that is 
joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And from the belly, you forgive from the heart, this heart, not this heart. We said this last week, didn't we? This is only one scripture that pertains to this blood pumper. And that's in Luke, I think it is. Men's heart will fail for fear. Fear can give you a heart attack. But all the other heart is belly, bowels, womb, innermost being, hidden man of the heart, the conscience. Your conscience goes gut hunch. For heaven's sakes, unsaved people locate better than Christians. Cops and military people say, you know, I want with my gut. Firemen, I mean, and police, a lot of times they go with their gut. That's a reality. Matter of fact, science calls it the second brain. The enteric nervous system, the seat of the emotions, conscience, in your spirit. This is the door of the heart. Everything happens here except thoughts. Trust in the Lord is yielding. Where's your will? 98% of the church thinks the will is here. 98% of the church thinks their conscience is here. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit. The conscience is the voice of your spirit. Even unsaved people have a conscience, but it's only as good as their value system. You know, if they're not a word person, they're not born again, they still have a conscience, but Lord knows they probably allow a lot. (laughs) But nevertheless... The conscience is in their human spirit, whether they're saved or not. How come the world can locate the heart and the innermost being and the secret place better than Christians? There needs to be a turning upside down in the church to where you go spirit, soul, body, instead of so much confidence in that intellect. Just because you lived your whole life like that doesn't mean that's the way it's going to work. So... Intimate knowledge of the Messiah, revelation of the Father, a a nature change. That's when you know that the Word's been made flesh. Corporateness. And it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. We're coming into a time where, you know, in the olden days, the safe place was the church. If you were a Christian and you had a lot of worldly persecution, oh, we don't believe in all that Jesus stuff and everything. But now the enemy's infiltrated the church, New Age and uh, just about everything else. But you know what's even more upsetting to me? New Age, Eastern mysticism, knew that you flowed from the center. Matter of fact, Christians weren't using the word center because New Age was using the word center. They hijacked it. But how come they knew where their spirit was better than Christians? I think it's in their blood pumper. We've got to get to the place where it's like, Real estate, real estate, location, location. <laughs> you know, if you don't know where the stuff's at, you're not going to function as spiritually efficient as you could. So learn these things. We could do diagrams all day long on showing you where these things are at, but it, it, it's, it's at, eventually you have to learn to live from that place. Look at, look at a simple scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your path. Just take a simple scripture. If you knew where everything was at, you would look at it like this. Trust. I yield my will, which is here. I yield my will to the Jesus in me. Trust in the Lord with all of my heart. That's mind, will, emotions, spirit. Spirit, mind, will... Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not on this. There's even a warning in it. Lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge. Do you know that word acknowledge? means through divine, intimate connection. Acknowledge him. Where is he at? Here. Acknowledge through divine it, you don't do divine, intimate connection. We had third graders over at Morningstar when, when we did the kids, remember? Everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Third graders, come on. We have adults that think the living water's in their head. Jesus didn't stand at the door of your head and knock and say, can I come in? He's t- <laughs> Whether you knew it or not, you, somehow you opened your heart. You dropped your guard. And even if you didn't know what you did, what you did was you opened, you yielded, 
You acknowledged him and he will direct your path. That's how to be led by the spirit. Acknowledge through divine, intimate connection. Acknowledge has nothing to do with your head. Acknowledge, it comes from the word that means through divine, intimate connection. All right? So now the gates of hell will not prevail against that. You're going to be open to God, shut to hell. That's the keys that, that he gave to the kingdom. Churches, the church, the corporate ecclesia is going to impact the world because you have the ability, you have these God tools, you have them ready and at hand to shut to hell and open to God. Really. You know, some people are so afraid of catching something from somebody else. You know, I, you know even preachers are, are a little concerned about laying their hands too quickly, and I understand where they're coming from. But you know what? I've seen more damage by association than I ever saw by laying on of hands. I saw more people catch demonic activity by associating than I did relationships. And they won't even know that it's demonic because it feels good. The church is going to impact the world now. All right. When God showed me this vision of this dome and these pillars, he also took me to Ezekiel 47, where he said, from the base of the temple would flow rivers of living water, and wherever those living waters went, produced life. That's what he's looking for from the corporate expression. But keep in mind, um, <clears throat> the Lord gave me, when he gave me the vision of this dome, he showed me four areas, and he says, you're probably not going to see the the ladder, to ladder in your life. Okay, well, that's now, God, come on. I'm an old guy now, all right? I want to see the ladder. But he says, first of all, it's like organic growth. People need to know who they are in Jesus. So personal, individual identity is the first thing you would lay in this newfound church. Teach the people who they are in Jesus, We've got to get the, the, the enemy wants to hijack <laughs> their personality. And a false personality is anything that comes against a new creation reality. So get these people to know who they are, that they are loved, that they are one of a kind. And even if they're not really walking that great with the Lord, God would just love to take your face and hold you in his hand. See, you're my favorite one and I love you. All right. When you have that kind of a relationship with him, you're going to be all right. You may not be full grown yet, but your heart's awakened to that love and uh, individual identity. Then individual gifting and calling. You can see a person's calling on their life by the way they interact with people for the most part, at least for the most part when they are genuinely loving people and not trying to manipulate people, not, not with an agenda. See, this church, when God told me to start this, he also said, teach them two main things, how to deal with their issues and how to die to an agenda. Because an agenda will short-circuit the plan that God had created for them. An agenda will feel good. An agenda will feel like, I got to have it, I got to have it. That's a sign right there that maybe you don't. If you think uh, you can't quit it or stop it, it may be an agenda that has nothing to do with God's plan for your life. No. He says, individual identity, individual gifting. Well, I told you, I built a dome church, geodesic dome. It was in the round. Uh, uh, we taught the reality and identity of who they were in Jesus over and over again. My basics course was Hebrews 6. And the Beatitudes and the parables were taught in the basics course. And uh, we had uh, young children. At that time, I had about 60 kids, I think. And they could stand on chairs and prophesy and pray over the adults. So we did level one and level two. And then God said, level three, you're not going to see till you're older. Level three is one of the most difficult areas in the church. And it's corporate identity. People are not all, no matter how mature they can be, they can be a mature individual but not ready for corporate life. They're afraid of the commitment. 
They're afraid of being vulnerable and open. You see, because relationship accountable. John Wesley turned England upside down, but they had accountability. When they came to America, they call them uh, house groups, house groups for fellowship. You can have a house group for fellowship that people are bleeding in there and you don't even know about it. And if they do, if you do find out about it, not necessarily does anybody know what to do about it. You just let them vent. Venting actually is not healing. Venting, and you know this as a psychologist, Jennifer, uh, venting fortifies the problem. You're strengthening it like a muscle. So, oh, but I just got to cry it out and everything. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with tears as long as it comes redemptive. Or like John Wimber said, when there's demonic manifestation, he said, the point is, is it coming or going? <laughs> right? <laughs> you want it to go. <laughs> right? But God is, is, is clearly saying that <clears throat> the third level, corporate identity, is going to be something that God is going to do. And then God gave me in 1989, he said, the scripture and the reason that I've emphasized corporate so much, and corporate scares people because they're, they're so afraid. So nobody's going to control me. You know, <laughs> Nobody wants to control you. Except you, everything we're teaching is how God controls you. If God really controls you, you will be ready for corporate life. You will be ready for accountability. When John Wesley's small groups came to America, they eliminated the accountability. And to this day, small groups are not really that productive in America. But they turned England upside down. Don't you wonder what's missing? Why could you turn England that was really, huh? One generation. Jennifer's a history student here. I'm getting coaching from the sidelines. But uh, one generation turned it. But the key was in their small group, there was accountability, but there was also the ability to know what to do when they were accountable. That you didn't use it to gossip or slander, you used it to bring a redemptive solution. What we have. Now, even in, in our churches, we have small groups that go deep. Small groups that go deep are for Kingdom Life Church people only, not outsiders, because what happens is the accountability loses. Now, we have several groups that are more outreach. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but the small groups that go deep are by invitation, and they're building quality relationships to minister one to another at a deep level. Well, when I go to other churches, I can go to anything they have. Well, there's a lot of things you can have here that you can go to. But that's not one of them. <laughs> that's the place where they're, they're building and establishing a relationship of dependable corporateness. And in that corporate identity, there is a power. Uh, we, we always had the church thing mentioning the cluster of grapes. Uh, one of the things that was brought up recently is, do you know that a cluster of grapes is a far more beautiful, godly design? It's a heavenly vision compared to a grape. Oh, but you're the most spiritual grape in the whole country. You're Joe Heavy Speaker grape. But it's not as beautiful to God as a cluster. It has a design that is unique in the blessings in the cluster, and usually the cluster ripens at the same time. Upper room was a ripening at the same time. Discipleship can be a ripening. Solomon's temple can be a ripening at the same time. And that's, that, that really is, to a large degree, what God was showing was like David's tabernacle. And it was what we're doing here on Tuesdays, which is for our church. It's not for outsiders. Our church on Tuesday is to pray for our church. That's a strange concept for people who are used to just whatever. But on Tuesdays, we're praying for that corporateness to come together in one accord. We don't invite visitors. Yes, you can have visitors on Sunday, but, <laughs> but the, point, the point is we're looking to build our church. A visitor comes in, what, what concern would they have over what you're trying to accomplish locally? 
Well, I'm part of the overall church. Well, I've seen that. That doesn't work real well. We're all part of the overall church. But everybody needs to know where's their tribe, where's home base, who do I submit to, who's my pastor? Here's the other word they use, friends. Oh, I have friends throughout the body of Christ. But I know who my pastor is. I know who my authorities are in my life. I know where I live, what I do for a living. Otherwise, you're disoriented. Now, if that's brought about in, in a carnal way, through control, then it's then you had like what they had in the shepherding movement. They had discipleship to where people were carrying the pastor's briefcase. Pastor needs to carry his own silly briefcase. Don't be tapping other people. That's not discipleship. All right. But discipleship is giving them opportunity. But what we do is say, we want to teach you how to deal with your issues and die to an agenda so that you can find out what God is doing in your life. Deal with your issues. Now, if you don't want to deal with your issues, you don't have any issues, this would be the last place you'd want to come. And if you have an agenda, this would be the last place you want to come. I remember that guy came one time, he played guitar, and he came walking in, and he goes, I'm a, I'm a classical guitar player, and I see you don't have a guitar. And uh, I said, well, we build relationship first, gifting second. Oh, bye. So long. Isn't that interesting? They have an agenda. You didn't care about these people. You didn't care about building relationship. You didn't care about growing and maturing and connecting. You cared about your gift. That's why third level, corporate identity is not easy, but it's going to be the safety in the days ahead because I believe the glory of the Lord is going to fill the temple. And the glory of the Lord is looking for one accord. One accord can't be mandated. One accord has to be a willing. I think there was 500 that were there in the upper room initially, ended up with 120. What's that tell you? All right. Gideon's army. God says, in the end times, Dennis, when you're old. Well, I'm old now, so I'm expecting this to happen. All right. He says, in the end times, this is the scripture he gave. The strategy in the end times is Judges 6.16. Everybody knows that by heart. Judges 6.16 is, you shall strike the enemy as one man. Now, was Gideon just the one that did the whole thing? No. There were 300. But what did these 300 do different than the 32,000 of the other Israelites? What did they do? They functioned together in one accord. Isn't that interesting? They were tested. I believe God tests our relationships to see if they're real or if they're phony. He tests us. He'll let you see what's in your heart. But ultimately, you will strike the enemy as one man. Let me put this together from beginning to end because th this, this got developed way, uh, way beyond uh, what you're seeing up here that you can well imagine over 40 years. All of those little truths got developed. But the revelation that I received from the beginning was Dennis, in the end times, in the latter times, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they're going to come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness in the end times. So there will be a, a return. You can count on some of your loved ones and distant family members to suddenly see the light, and you're going to be pleasantly surprised at the turning and a returning to the Lord their God and the Messiah their King. The second thing was that, <clears throat> that this God-sized vision for building will be that you will see the corporateness come to pass. You're going to see one accord. All around the world, you're going to see little groups that had built quality relationships, one for another, that God's going to visit them in power doesn't have to be the mega churches that get the, it can be a small house group of people with one accord getting a beautiful glory of God. Jennifer's vision was to see the glory of the Lord on little groups, little Pentecosts all around the world. And it, all it takes is a genuine seeking of God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. He said, 
the corporateness, you'll see it. You'll see it. And thirdly, um, lastly, you know, um, not only will you see the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, but you're going to see the one new man being demonstrated all over. One new man, a corporate mature bride, made herself ready. Do you know the new Jerusalem, the city that came down, that's the bride. And it's a cube. The height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God is a cube. And God said it's totally developed. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.